Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming in the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15:18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. With only days to go before the start of the Winter Olympics in China, the Chinese Communist Party is forcing lockdowns without explanation of entire communities near the Olympic Village. Also, the government is requiring people to be tested for COVID if they've recently purchased cough suppressants or other cold or flu medications. Our next guest has concerns for the Chinese people beyond pre-Olympic COVID lockdowns and testing. Todd Nettleton is Chief of Media Relations at The Voice of the Martyrs. He's also host of VOM Radio and author of the book, When Faith is Forbidden, 40 Days on the Front Lines with Persecuted Christians. I'm assuming for Chinese Christians, there's more to be concerned about than COVID-19 lockdowns and testing prior to the Olympics. So usually events like this cause authorities to detain Christian leaders to prevent them from making contact with foreigners or causing embarrassment for the government. So what's the latest? What's happening to Christians in China as the Olympics approaches? Well, that is a great question. And I think some of that we will find out in the weeks to come, probably after the Olympics. As you mentioned, uh, it has been known to happen. I know I was in China before the 2008 Olympics, and one of the pastors that we met with on that visit, uh, as the Olympic Games got closer, he was detained. He was held throughout the Games and held a few days after the Games uh, to keep him from reaching out to Westerners, to keep his story from being told as part of that Olympic coverage. Uh, so certainly as we get closer and closer, it is a key and strategic time to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in China. And this treatment's really nothing new, right? Because many Chinese Christians say, government control of their churches and lives has gotten worse in recent years. Yeah, it has gotten dramatically worse. It, it, it has become a surveillance state. Uh, the cameras are everywhere. The cameras are watching. They're hooked to facial recognition technology. Uh, and this is coming from the national level. You know, 10 years ago, we would say, hey, in this province of China, there's heavy persecution. But look over in this province, the church is operating without a lot of interference. Today, we can say it is happening in every part of China. It is driven by the national government. President Xi Jinping was formerly a provincial leader. His province was one of those known for heavy persecution of Christians. And so he has brought that to the national level now, and this is being orchestrated by Beijing all over the country. Even Christians communicating online, uh, on social media and so forth, organizing uh, meetings or prayer groups, uh, they're coming under attack. Yeah, the government is constantly monitoring the online activity of China's citizens, including our Christian brothers and sisters there. And so uh, they are tamping down on online worship activities, online Christian activities. You can no longer order a Bible online in China. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, the Chinese communist government wants to control the hearts and minds of the people. And they see a follower of Jesus Christ as a direct threat because someone who says, my first priority is following Jesus, 
obviously their first priority is not being a good communist. And so uh, Christians are seen as a threat. Their message is seen as a threat. And the government is doing everything in their power to keep that message from spreading. Back to the Olympics now. I know Open Doors CEO David Curry is urging people, especially people of faith, to not watch the Olympics on television. Uh, low ratings, I guess, would send a clear message to Beijing about its religious freedom and human rights violations. I know VOM's taking another approach, China Prayer 2022. Please explain. Well, we know that uh, many people will be watching the Olympic Games. You know, some will choose not to, some will choose to watch. For all of those, though, we hope that the Olympic coverage is a reminder to pray for Christians in China. You know, we're going to see uh, events, we're gonna see figure skating, we're gonna see ski jumping. We'll probably see a lot of great shots of the Great Wall of China. We want every one of those things to be a reminder. Hey, I have Christian brothers and sisters in China who are suffering because of the name of Jesus Christ. This is a great time to pray for them. And so we have set up a website, Pray for China. 2022.com. We're encouraging people to say, hey, yes, I'm going to pray for Chinese Christians every day during the Olympics. You can register on the site. There's some tools to help you share on the site. There's some specific ways we can pray. Uh, but again, the, the key is we're going to use the Olympics as a reminder, a daily reminder to pray for our brothers and sisters in China. And, and what specifically should our viewers be praying? What do the Chinese Christians say? How can we pray? You know, one of the great challenges and great lessons for us is their prayer request is not pray that we won't suffer anymore, pray that the persecution will end. Their prayer request is pray that we'll be faithful to Christ in spite of the persecution. Uh, but we can certainly pray for a sense of encouragement for Chinese brothers and sisters. We can pray for God's protection over them, protection from their own government. We can also pray especially for those like Pastor Wang Yi who are currently in prison because of their faith in Christ. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Tensions between Ukraine and Russia. President Biden saying he'll be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe and NATO countries in the, quote, near term as a congressional delegation visited Kiev. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is there on the ground with the latest. This morning, the world awaits Russia's next move. The Kremlin insists they will not start a war with Ukraine, but the U.S. says Russia is in a position to invade. The Kremlin trying to pressure NATO to guarantee that Ukraine will never join the alliance. Russia moving more than 100,000 troops to the Ukraine border with tanks, armored vehicles, and setting up field hospitals indicating they could be preparing for combat casualties. Russia even positioning troops in nearby Belarus. However, Ukraine's president is doubling down on the threat Russia poses. <inaudible> president Zelensky with a message not to stir up panic as the U.S. goes on alert to support neighboring countries. I'll be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe and the NATO countries in the near term. A U.S. official telling ABC News no deployment orders have been given. Most military experts, though, say the force Russia massed on the border is not ready for a major invasion. But Joint Chiefs Chairman Mark Milley warning of a horrific outcome if Russia does invade Ukraine. Given the type of forces that are arrayed, if that was unleashed on Ukraine, it would be significant, very significant. 
and it would result in a significant amount of casualties. The Pentagon saying it's ready to respond if necessary. We placed thousands of U.S. troops on prepare to deploy orders earlier this week. If NATO activates its response forces, these troops will be ready to go. And today, we got an inside look at a civil defense training class, about 200 women attending, learning personal defense tactics and survival tips in the event of an invasion. Here in Kiev and across this country, there isn't a sense of panic just yet, but people are preparing for an invasion. Now, one big takeaway from that course is that the key to survive a potential invasion or war is to have a plan. And the folks that we've spoken to here in Kiev say that is what they're focused on. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention, his return is near. Outside a church, under the open sky, villagers in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo find the only shelter they hope will keep them safe from the bullets and the bloodshed. The attack began in Nyesisi, Ngogo and Kanombe. When we were in the field on Wednesday, we heard bullets over the hills and we fled, abandoned everything and now we are here in Kibumba. We spend the night in the church while others sleep outside. We have nothing to eat, no food, no water or medicine. At least 2,000 people abandoned their homes this week to escape fighting between the army and the M23. An armed group that rebelled against the government in 2012. We saw several dead people. I lost my children and my husband in the chaos and I've been left with nothing. In Yesisi, one of the six villages caught in the crossfire, farms lie untended. Homes are empty and not a soul to be seen. Back at the church in Kibumba, people from other villages tell how they too were caught in the violence. I was at home when I saw soldiers shooting bullets in the hills and other bullets coming from the other side. Since November, M23 fighters have been accused of several attacks on the army, the latest on Tuesday. UN peacekeepers are on the ground, but for these families, it may be too soon to return. Luke. 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Tonight, Afghanistan is in crisis. Aid agencies like UNICEF, the only source of food for millions. Taxi driver Edris Mohammadi told me he can't feed his family because he can't find work. And he blames the U.S. This bad situation only factor is USA. It's been five months since the chaotic and deadly U.S. withdrawal. It feels so strange to be back. The airport almost looks normal. But on the streets, people are desperate, some selling their kidneys for cash. The situation is very bad. We are in a fast unraveling humanitarian crisis, and the level of suffering is quite unparalleled. The new Taliban government has no money. Nine billion dollars in Afghan assets are frozen, most by the U.S., because the Taliban is a designated terrorist group. The Taliban leadership is trying to show the world it's changed, announcing women and girls will be allowed back into classrooms. Yet many women are living in fear. Come back, this was posted last week. Women's rights activist Tamana Paryani screaming for help saying the Taliban had come to arrest her. She and her sisters haven't been seen since. Taliban leadership said the video was fake. What is this? At this beauty salon, this worker says the Taliban posted a sign telling women to wear burqas. Do you feel safe? 
Absolutely not, she says. Every minute we are scared. The U.N. special envoy saying there's compelling evidence of intimidation and a deterioration in respect for human rights. Meanwhile, Americans are still stranded here, along with thousands of America's Afghan allies. One former Army translator, now in hiding, told us he applied for a visa in August and is still waiting. Three and a half months you've been waiting and yeah. have heard nothing. Nothing. Many have turned to nonprofit veterans groups like Project Dynamo, which says they've evacuated more than 2,000 people. How many are left? I have no idea, but I can tell you that people call us every single day and say, help me, help me, help me. Left behind in a country now falling apart. The U.S. has already donated more than $700 million in humanitarian aid to Afghanistan, but aid agencies say they now need billions. We are living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. God in his grace and mercy is warning the world of his impending judgment. The Bible refers to this judgment as the tribulation in which God will pour out his wrath on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. I have had many people ask the question, how do you know Jesus is returning? And why is today any different than any other time in history? Jesus gives his followers the answer to that question in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus told his followers that there would be a convergence of Bible prophecy right before his return. Notice Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, Jesus used the plural word things meaning when you see multiple prophecies converging at the same time that his return was at the doors as we read in Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. There can be no denying all these things are beginning to take place. The next question is, how soon is the rapture of the church? Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. NYPD officer Wilbert Mora, who had been in critical condition since being shot, responding to a domestic violence call Friday night, has died. NYPD Commissioner Keyshawn Sewell made the announcement on Twitter Tuesday afternoon saying, quote, he was three times a hero. 27-year-old Mora joined the NYPD in 2018. Neighbors describe him as a sweet guy who looked out for them. This neighbor, very, very nice neighbor. He is now the second NYPD officer to die in the line of duty within a week after his partner, 22-year-old Jason Rivera, died Friday night responding to the same call. That's when police say they were called to a Harlem apartment for a domestic dispute. The suspect, 47-year-old LaShawn McNeil, pulled out a gun with a high-capacity magazine and started firing, hitting both officers. A third officer, Sumit Sulan, also a 27-year-old rookie who Mora was reportedly training, fired the shot that initially wounded the suspect. Investigators later found another high-capacity rifle underneath McNeil's mattress. McNeil died at Harlem Hospital Monday. The families of both officers, Mora and Rivera, mourning the shocking loss. Even in death, Mora continues giving as an organ donor. We turn now to Houston, where a man is in custody after allegedly shooting three police officers. Our Houston affiliate KHOU reports that 31-year-old Roland Caballero was arrested yesterday after a lengthy standoff with police. Fortunately, all three officers are expected to survive. But as our Jeff Begay shows us, it's just the latest incident in what was a deadly 2021 and already a violent start to the new year for police nationwide. 
This vehicle led police on a chase through neighborhoods in central Houston yesterday. Its driver fled from a home after officers responded to a disturbance call. Once the car crashed, police say the driver opened fire on officers. Three of them were shot. Cell phone video from the opposite angle shows the suspect running away from the scene with what appears to be an automatic weapon in hand as officers chased after him on foot. Police say he then hijacked another car and fled. That vehicle's driver was not hurt. Police eventually tracked the suspect to a home where officers again took fire during a prolonged standoff. The suspect surrendered after several hours. Police say he had a gunshot wound to the neck. These violent individuals, I'm damn tired of it. Across the country, since the start of the new year, there have been numerous instances of police being targeted and killed. Also in the Houston area, a corporal was shot dead during a traffic stop. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Let's bring in Nassau County Police Benevolent Association President Tommy Shevlin. Uh, and you have served on the front lines yourself as well, Tommy, welcome. I want to quote a piece uh, today. This is from the former lieutenant governor of New York, by the way, um, who was a recent crime victim herself. She says there's no such thing as a minor crime, especially when it happens to you. She says allowing so-called minor crimes, shoplifting, carjacking, turnstile hopping, check foregoing, forging, and vandalism is a choice. She goes on to say prosecutors are too ready to assign victimhood to perpetrators instead of to the rest of us who are disgusted and intimidated by the lawlessness. Tommy, what do you make of where we are right now in some of our big cities? Crime is skyrocketing, and what we saw last week with two NYPD officers ambushed and executed just for wearing their uniform, um, it, there's no words for this. I have never seen it this bad, and it's time for people to come together. We need the politicians to step up and, and stop all the talk. We need action. So the brand new mayor there, Eric Adams in New York, um, has worn a uniform himself. He has talked about uh, his plans to crack down on crime and gun crime specifically. Um, but Gothamist says this. Um, they say progressive politicians and activists who work in communities of color are voicing their concern that Adams' new plan will actually roll back recent reforms and lead to more aggressive policing and incarceration. They say that is not the answer. How do you respond? Well, then what is the answer? Um, if, if we're not going to prosecute crimes and we're not going to hold criminals accountable, then when does this end? It's only going to get worse. He needs to get his district attorney to do his job and prosecute criminals. And we need to give the judges back their discretion to do their job that they were appointed or elected to do. I thought it was interesting that Mayor Adams, one of the points in his plan was to get the courts back up and running, that they have been um, limited with COVID and all kinds of other things that he wants to see them fully running so that cases can process through. Meantime, we know that um, President Biden is planning to go up and meet with Mayor Adams to talk about some of the situation uh, there and crime more broadly. Um, what kind of conversation would you hope they'd have? Well, honestly, I mean, he should be coming with how bad things are and after we just lost two heroes. But at the end of the day, what are they going to do? They can talk about being proactive all they want. Again, if they're not willing to, to talk about bail reform changes and get the district attorney to do their job, then what's going to change? You, you want the police to go out there and, and make arrests, be proactive. And listen, they're arresting criminals, and some of these criminals are back on the street before we're done doing paperwork. Yeah, I mean, how is that impacting... The morale, which I know is a main concern for you now of officers who are walking into this every day voluntarily, and we can't thank them enough. It's, it's terrible. Police officers' morale is at an all-time low. I mean, think about it. We risk our lives every single day and night, weekends, holidays. We miss family functions. We miss our children's sporting events, right, to risk our lives for strangers. And we're treated like the bad guys and girls. The world is upside down and something has to change. 
It's not right how we're being treated and demonized. What does the Bible say about lawlessness? To be lawless is to be without any rules or order. Laws are necessary in a sinful world as we read in 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. 1 John 3, 4 defines sin as lawlessness. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. When a society ignores the law, lawlessness is the result, and chaos ensues. The time of the judges after Joshua's death was marked by upheaval, oppression, and general disorder, as we read in Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. God has a purpose for establishing human government, to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right, as we read in 1 Peter 2.14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. In other words, lawlessness is condemned in Scripture. On Judgment Day, many will stand before Christ claiming a connection with Him that exists only in their own minds. They will rehearse their good deeds done in His name, only to hear Jesus declare to them, I never knew you, as we read in Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. At that time, those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the blazing furnace, as we read in Matthew 13, 41, and 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ will shine like the sun, as we read in Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Christ will have the ultimate victory and will eliminate lawlessness forever. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, Salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's Word, as we read in Ezekiel 36.27 and James 2.26. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14:17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12.13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you.
Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!